Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be his people, people, now and forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Glory to God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are most high. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 69, verses 8 to 20. Let us read it together in unison. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. 
reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the twelve apostles, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they had called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. A new way to do my homily. Now, a couple of months ago in January, and it's hard to believe that was six months ago, I was stranded at the Midway Airport in Chicago for nine hours. For those who have traveled to Midway or, or are frequent flyers, they, Midway has the name of being the waiting room for hell. And I was stuck there for nine hours. And after a while, I found a wonderful little bar place and uh, had some good food and got into wonderful conversations with some of the other folks, folks who, like me, were stuck for many hours in the airport. And after a while, uh, I had steadfastly tried very hard not to tell them what I did for a living because that would have ended the conversation. But eventually it got around to, so why are you stuck here and what is it that you do for the rest of your life? And the minute that you say you are an Episcopal priest and a hospital chaplain, there are only so many reactions that people will have. The first one is that everyone will turn to stone, but you can hear their minds worrying, wondering whether or not they have said anything blasphemous in the last hour or so. And after that, there's an array of things that will happen, an array of reactions that people can have. One of them being Run. Oh, look, my plane is at the gate. Run. Another is to point out to me what uh, a blasphemy it is for women to be in the pulpit uh, and to be seen and heard. Another is to uh, basically play stomp the priest. See how well I know my Bible and my theology. And, and that's always very interesting because they want to make sure I can quote various things. And then there's the folks who want to know about being an Episcopalian. Do Episcopalians read the Bible and do they believe in God? Do Episcopalians go to church and do they believe in the Trinity? And do they have creeds? Well, it's obvious they have women priests. And I would go, yes, yes. Yes, yes. We have a sense of humor. We don't require you to check your brain at the door. And then there are the folks who, at that moment, suddenly want to discuss things they've always wanted to discuss it with their pastor if they had one, or if they had one. Uh, theology, spirituality, philosophy. Does God love me? What if I sin? And those are the most wonderful conversations. And that is what happened uh, while I was there in Midway. Uh, the folks took it as a wonderful time to ask someone the questions they've always had and of someone they'll never see again. So it's perfectly safe. And this is the only time that this has happened to me. The bartender looked at me and he said, so, can Episcopalians drink? And I said, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we do. We have wine on Sunday. And he goes, well, have a beer. And that was the first time when I thought, well, this is going really well. And, and I, I bring this up because I have changed my attitude towards these things happening. I look at them as opportunities now, and, and I have a sense of humor about them. 
because I can watch it happening and it, it doesn't bother me personally. But I can tell you that early on and at the beginning, that was not always the case. In fact, when you mention to somebody that you think you have a call, one of the things that they do is they put you in discernment, which can last for a year and a half to two years, about whether you truly have a call. And, and the first step in that is they give you a book, Discerning Your Call, The Life of the Prophets. And in that book, they start with Moses and they introduce how each of the prophets was called, but they don't stop there. What they do is they tell you what it was like to be a prophet. Let's take Moses. Moses, of course, didn't want to go back to Egypt, but he was going, as Bishop Thompson used to say, you can run, but you cannot hide. And here is Moses. He's stuck with 300,000 plus Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years, all of those unruly folks. And when they get to the promised land, the Lord says to him, look at the promised land, but you cannot go in. That's the simplest one. And then you work your way up to Jeremiah. Now, today's uh, first lesson is from the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is the largest book in the Bible. And in some places, the commentaries call him the weeping prophet. And he weeps because if you read what he's talking about, it's not going well. He has been beaten up kidnapped, and my personal favorite is thrown into a cistern where the king hoped that he would die because you see, you cannot actually overtly kill the anointed of the Lord, but if he just happens to die in the cistern, that would be okay. His family basically disowns him and tells him, you are making everybody crazy. Please stop prophesying for the Lord. And after you've read all of these things, they ask you, do you still want to continue in the, on the process? And if you say yes, they send you for three days of psychiatric testing. And I can't make this up because they assume that after you've read that, you have something that's either God's calling you or you need to discuss that. And you know, when I was in seminary, I remember how much we wanted to get ordained. In fact, a whole bunch of us have been talking about our anniversaries because June is ordination month. And we were remembering all the crazy things that, that happened during our ordinations. And I remember the one thing that stuck out at that time. My mentor said to me, he said, well, kiddo, you got your collar. Welcome to the other side. Your life has changed now. And I was like, oh, yes, I get to do word and sacrament. I get to baptize people. I get all of these things. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? That's the joy. There's another side to that. And I had no idea what he was talking about. But after ordination, I remember there were some folks who had been friends for a long time who suddenly didn't call anymore or didn't answer my calls. There were social uh, colleagues that didn't respond anymore, that cut us out of their lives. Uh, there were times when people I knew very well for very long periods of time treated me and my husband, because your family gets that too, differently. And, and it's, some of it is subtle. And some of it is just very strange. And it, and it is a struggle. And particularly when somebody says to you, why did you give up that wonderful career you had to be a Bible thumper? And you think, serving the Lord is really kind of moving up. But not everybody feels that when you do the Lord's work, that somehow that's a wonderful thing. And, and it's not just when you're ordained. And I want to be very clear about that. It, it's, it's also other times. Um, you will have that if you truly 
try to do God's work. One of the most heartbreaking things that I really paid no attention to when I was in seminary was the young man whose family disowned him because he was going to the priesthood. And what it took for him to keep going forward. And, and this is what Jesus is talking about in today's gospel. In actuality, this is part two of the gospel that we had last week. And every gospel, in fact, every lesson we have is out of context because the lectionary makes it that way. And so because probably anywhere from 10 to 60% of any book, gospel, epistle gets in to the lectionary. The exception to that is, is Mark, which is the shortest gospel. And most of these at the time, they were written to be preached to folks in a whole story. They were letters that Paul wrote. They were meant to be read in their entirety. And until they had translations and they needed to kind of keep them all even, there were no chapters and verses. So when they go to uh, uh, putting the lectionary together, they divide these up. And so everything is kind of out of context. And so today, what you hear is what we call a hard text. It's a hard text because Jesus sounds like that really cranky, streperous headmaster who's really making it difficult for folks. But in reality, it's part two of where he was last week, the beginning of chapter 10. So here's the second or third week of Pentecost and we're already in Matthew chapter 10. And what happens in chapter 10 is that Jesus has been prepping the disciples who will become the apostles to go out in his name, to take the good news to the people to their neighborhoods. We'll worry about all the far places later, but take that good news out there and here's what's gonna happen. And he tells them all the things that, that could possibly go wrong. And today he's finishing it up. Yes, you will go out there and it will be wonderful. You will bring the good news. You will bring hope to the people. You will be out there, but you will face disappointment. You will face heartbreak because not everybody wants to listen. And you know, that's that way, whether you're ordained or not, because when you do God's will, when you truly believe in bringing the good news out and in living a Christ centered life and in putting the will of God before the will of the world, you're gonna be in conflict at some point. Because putting God first is not easy. It sometimes means losing your family. Sometimes it means losing your colleagues. Uh, it, this is just me, but before I was ordained, uh, I had been out on the road and my boss called me, and, and by the way, we were lucky they didn't have cell phones, so she had to wait till I got home and she calls me and it's Holy Saturday. And she says, you have to come in tomorrow morning. We're gonna practice for our presentation on Friday. And I said, it's Easter. I go to church and, and we have family things. And she said, I don't care that it's Easter. And I said, well, it's Easter. I'm not coming into the office. And what she said was, get your priorities straight. Either come in tomorrow morning or don't come in on Monday. And I said, I have my priorities straight. And I did not go in on Monday. Of course, she called me and said, why aren't you in? But the reaction from my colleagues was telling. Half of them thought, wow, great. You stood up for what is important to you. And the other half really laid into me. How dare you put going to church before your colleagues and not coming in when we were all there and we had to go through it and you got out of it. It was a shock. 
And I've heard this many times before, that if you put your moral center, your Christ center, forefront of all things, if you make decisions based on God's will, that it's going to be difficult. But that's interesting. That's the challenge of bringing the good news. I, I always say, you know, uh, very often, even in the book of Jeremiah, the underlying message, despite all the things that happened to him, is one of hope. Every book in the Bible has as an underlying message hope. Hope that you are never alone. Hope that you are one of God's children. Jesus says, look at those little birds. Look at those little birds. If God cares about them, how much more you? And when you are doing God's work of building the kingdom here, God's not going to leave you alone. You will have moments of incredible grace, and you will have moments of sorrow. But if you're forever focused on the good news, the good news will instill in your heart the joy that God gives to all of us who follow his will. And then, of course, sometimes you might also get a free beer. Amen. Prayers of the people are according to 405, found on page 389 in the Book of Common Prayer. Please offer your own prayers, either silently or aloud. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Thomas, Kenneth, and Nettie, our own bishops, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. 
pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live and work in this community, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. for the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present, for those who are watching at a distance, and for those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being free from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, to you O Lord. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
and Somalis, for their life and their ministry and their love and their compassion and the joy that they bring into the world. We give thanks for the year that they have had, and we ask your grace and wonder for the year ahead. May you hold them always in your heart and give them the wonder of all of your creation. In your name we ask and pray. Amen. And happy birthday. To all who have June anniversaries. O oh Lord, we ask your blessing upon these couples and their lives together and the commitments that they have made to each other. We ask that you give them the joy to remember all of the reasons why they came together. And we ask you to continue that joy in their lives. Let them know that they live in you always, and that they are loved and wondered. And so, Lord, give them strength and courage and humor and patience. And we ask that you give them another year of all the fun and wonder that is in your universe and your creation. Give them fun and glory and a wonderful anniversary to share together. In your name we pray and ask. Amen. So we have a few announcements today. Uh, the first is that Tuesday evening there is an online vestry meeting. And I believe that there will be information on the website for that. And let's see what else. Uh, I'm getting better at this. So, a message from the building committee and the vestry. You know, uh, there is that old uh, saying, I guess it's a cliche at this point, may you live in interesting times. And there are many who believe that that's a curse as well as a blessing. Uh, so for the Building Investor Committee, they have been working very diligently on how we continue forward worshiping together, whether it is online, live stream, or in this building, or outside. It's a new world for all of us and new decisions that we have to make. And so they really have been trying to find the best ways to do that with love and compassion and with the safety of everyone in mind. And so we're going to try and be diligent and intentional about uh, communicating how we're making these decisions and what we're thinking. And I hope that you take a moment to let us know what your thoughts are about this, because it is with you and with God that we will move forward in the best way possible for this congregation. I'd like to say to folks, um, we will open up at some point, and all will be welcome. But that doesn't mean if you're not comfortable that you must come, because we will not stop the doing what we're doing right now, because everybody is in a different place. And as we work through trying to figure out how we do online services better, we need to hear from you and know whether you can access our online worship or not. Uh, it is very important. So uh, please feel free to contact the vestry or me, and uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you. And know that every day I pray for everyone. I pray for the list of the church register. And I do that because I cannot see you, and I cannot tell you that I pray for you. But you are thought of and loved and missed. And someday we will gather together with all of the hopes and touches and things that we truly cherish about our community of faith. We ask your patience, forbearance, and I hope you have a sense of humor because none of us knows exactly how to do this perfectly. So thank you for your patience to let me talk to you this morning. And um, let's go to the blessing. And someday we'll actually have music. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. And the Holy Spirit works online just as in person. Amen.
Let us go in peace, in love, and serve the Lord.